Wow. Right. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I'm glad to see you in uh, large numbers. So you haven't given up. And, uh, the longer you stay, the more enjoyable it becomes, even though the first two days are kind of most painful. Um, well, actually, you did force me to go back to my student days and write up some code in the toolbox, which is not my toolbox. I'll just show you. I prepared the data for you, so I'll upload this later on today. For the afternoon session, you'll get the data. So this is one of the examples that actually you will see. OK, right. There you go. Now, just very briefly to, to give you an idea what, what this is. Now, your target is 0. Uh, this line is one step controllable set to 0. The next one is 2. Then it's 3, 4, and so on and so forth. This is your initial condition. And this is your controlled trajectory using the minimum effort control that we designed yesterday. So the control works in a such a way that it figures out what set you are in. At that point in time, it generates the control using the functions that we wrote up. And uh, at the next point in time, it evaluates the same. What you can observe, because it's a minimum effort control, the trajectory that you get somehow lies on the boundaries of these controllability sets. Because this minimum effort control is, so to speak, lazy control. Now, of course, you can change the simulation very briefly by changing initial condition. So you can pick an initial condition you like, but you can tell me what initial condition you want, but only constraint you have, your initial condition has to be in this larger set. So tell me an initial condition you want us to try. Let's see if my code really works. <laughs> minus 8, 3? Minus 8, minus 8, 3. Yeah, sure. OK. OK. So your initial, that's x of 1. OK, minus 8, 3. You're getting initial condition, which is very close to the, this one. OK, so this is your trajectory. Now, actually, you can see a bit more. Now, first thing you can observe, what the control does, it really pushes the state from the kth controllable set to the kth minus 1, and so on and so forth. So in a minimum number of steps, it actually reaches the origin. Uh, if you look at the trajectory, this is the trajectory you have obtained. So actually, it's re it has reached the 0 in finite time. This is corresponding control. Because it's minimum effort control, it's not necessarily always using full control authority. It uses full control authority only when it's on the boundary, when it becomes kind of bang-bang control. And this is the value function. So at the initial time, what it tells you, it tells you the state is in the x5, x4, x3, x2, x1, and it has reached x0. It stays in x0. In this particular case, because 0 is a control invariant set, state stays at 0. There is no guarantee in general for an arbitrary target set that actually you will remain in a target set. And if you think about many physical problems, you may not want to stay at the target set. If you're launching a missile from a point A to a point B, your missile should not stay at B, it should explode at B. So just to touch point B. Okay. So it depends. But for the model predictive control problems we are dealing with, actually you will have stabilizing conditions, meaning that actually behavior will be nice, that actually you will be staying at the equilibrium. OK. Now, for this, I have prepared a bunch of the code. And in the afternoon sessions, we'll see where we stand with the code, your code. I have prepared two examples for you, so you can play around with. And then, of course, uh, as I said, this is a pseudo code. It doesn't include various testings, checkings. This is something you can build on later on. OK. I'm not going to check if state is not here or there. I'm just, this assumes everything works perfectly well, but you can add various testings at later stage. I think this is more of programming and considering the cases. But I want to ask you two things before we proceed. So the first thing is, OK, so you can think of this control method as the one in which actually you construct these sets offline. And then online, you're figuring out where your state is and applying suitable control. So there is a division. Now, when you construct the controllable sets offline, how do you stop? How many of these sets do you construct? Do you have any idea? How would you do it? What would be kind of meaningful approaches to that? Yes? Until it contains our initial state. OK, so one of the ways would be to prescribe the set of initial conditions of interest. So say you want to control all initial conditions between minus 10 and 10 in all directions. And you grow your controllable sets. 
Assuming they cover your set of initial conditions, you can stop. You're fine. Okay. That's one of the ways. What would be the other way? Now, first, is there a guarantee that actually you'll cover an arbitrary set of initial conditions? There is no guarantee. Namely, at one point in time, actually, these sets may converge, even in finite time. If they converge in a finite time, that means going from a specific target set, this is what you can cover. This, however, doesn't mean this is all you can cover f using different target set. Because essentially, the sequence of sets you generate depend on your target set. Okay. So heuristics you can actually come up with for deciding how many of these sets to compute offline would be either as covering an initial set of conditions of interest, which is typically the one that it actually is proposed in the literature, or the one when you converge. Okay. <laughs> that would actually immediately imply your n. So actually when you do this n step controllability, you wouldn't fix an n, but actually you would run it in a loop where n is increased. Okay. So Let's catch up on what we've done. As I said, I mean, I will provide this pseudo code for controllability later on in the afternoon. But for the rest of the exercises, I'll be picking up code from you. I'm way too old to, to code up things myself. It's too much of red code and too much of red comments. And actually, changing that can be a bit of painful. OK, so this is what we've done. And now, actually, the second question that you want to ask, if you have a control dynamics, very much in the same manner, because you don't have a control, the next question, the question of safety is related to the positive invariance. So essentially, what's going to happen when you have autonomous dynamics defined by x plus c equals f of x, subject to the constraints x in x? Essentially, you can't talk about control invariance, but you can talk about positive invariance. Now, what positive invariance means? It means that actually once the state is inside of the set, it remains in the set for all times. OK. Now, this is obviously the question of the safety that we already mentioned. Yeah? When you have this chemical reactor wanting temperature between certain range, you don't want this only finitely many steps, because presumably you'll be using that plant for many generations to earn some profit, if nothing else. So. <laughs> A set omega is positively invariant set if and only if for all states in it or in the set, states satisfy constraints and successive states are still in it. Okay. So that means for all x in omega, x satisfies the constraints and f of x is in omega. Now, if you, if you look at this condition, f of x in omega, x in x, we have already recognized this object to be actually pre-image restricted to x of omega under f. Okay. And then essentially, there is no projection operation because you don't have variable u. It's just autonomous dynamics. So one step backward reachable set is just this pre-image restricted to x of omega. Okay. And then, of course, if this property holds, you immediately see that actually omega is a subset of f to the minus 1 y of omega, which means actually omega is a subset of b of omega. So every point in a set has to be reachable from B of omega, or created as an image from the points of B of omega. OK, so this is a condition. In general, of course, depending on the structure of f and the constraint sex, it might be very difficult to, comp to c Now, there is a question, what does it mean to compute a set? Or what does it mean to compute a function? Question of computing a value of function is much more easier to answer. You evaluate ln of 2, ln of 5. But what does it mean to compute ln x or some nasty function somebody comes up? So it, you, know, you need to have some means of describing this object. And if you want to use it in a computer, it means of storing it. And for that reason, actually, I did introduce a structure, polyhedral structure, where actually the sets are described through matrices. So knowing the set means actually knowing the matrices or extreme points. And this is, this is one of the things that you, you actually, it's, it's, it's very frequent in, in lectures and in talks I give that actually the question arises, what does it mean to compute the set? Does it mean to actually plot the set? Or does it mean to have a representation of set you can use? And if you have a representation of a set to use, what kind of representation do you have? Explicit or implicit? So it's a lot of questions. So I want you to keep in mind that actually the question of actually computing a set is a non-trivial question. And for that reason, actually, we are dealing with these polyhedral structures, which allows us to actually finitely represent the set, to have a, something which actually allows us to plot the set, to use the set, use the description of the set. So for that reason, if you look for the affine systems, constraints, which are polyhedral sets, well, 
Computing the pre-image is very easy. All what you do, you take this AX plus B, you plug it inside GX less or equal than H, you obtain this, you rewrite this. You see actually that all what you need to do, you put these matrices together and you're obtaining one step backward reachable set as a polyhedral set. So it's very easy to construct really. And then positive invariance condition, omega subset B of omega becomes this one. And this condition actually can be verified by solving linear programming or duality of linear programming. Sorry, I'll just put it on silent. It's my fault. Okay. Whoever is Lynn, thank you for the email. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, so th this is it. So, later on in the afternoon, your further numerical exercise will be to actually construct the. Now, it's not going to be one step controllable set, it's going to be one step backward reachable set. Construction of this is much simpler. Again, it's three, three lines of the code with the structures for the system constraints we have in, in place. Okay, now the next question is actually, <laughs> okay, so let me actually ask you first, first thing first. Okay, presumably when you deal with the dynamics, you're typically interested, especially within the context of optimal control or model predictive control of stability of an equilibrium point. And one of the basic assumptions, which can be called properness assumptions, so to speak, is the assumption that you have an admissible equilibrium point. So you want to control a system to an admissible equilibrium point. What does that mean? It means you have a point for which x is equal f of x and for which x is inside of x. Okay. Typically it's assumed that that point is zero. Now that point as an equilibrium is nothing else than the positively invariant set. Yeah? Because at zero you stay at zero. So that's the simplest example of positively invariant sets. So equilibrium points union of equilibrium points and so on and so forth. Now, in general, actually, you're interested in two things. You're interested in, so to speak, minimal positively invariant set, which typically in optimal control and model predictive control is going to be desired equilibrium point you wish to control, and the maximal positively invariant set. Now, maximal, why, do you, why would you be interested in maximal? Well, you want to figure out all initial conditions from which it's safe to run your plant or to run your system. I think that's quite reasonable. Maximality, of course, it's uh, considered with respect to the set inclusion. So in plain words, maximal positively invariant set, it's positively invariant set that contains all other positively invariant sets. As I mentioned yesterday for control invariant sets, this is related to the infinite step backward reachability problem. N namely, you can look at all trajectories and you can figure out all initial conditions for which trajectories, okay, for which trajectories remain within the constraints and dynamically consistent. Now, of course, this gives you a recursion, and this would be case step backward reachable sets. Now, of course, of the most interest is the one when you actually figure out all states within the state constraint set. So that means you initiate this with x. Uh, this iteration under continuity of the function f and the compactness of x, for example, is guaranteed to actually produce the maximal positively invariant set. But the properties remain very much the same. First, a requirement to stay k plus 1 steps within the constraints is a harder requirement than actually to stay k steps. So therefore, xk plus 1 is smaller than xk. Yep. You have more constraints. You require trajectory k plus 1 time to stay. Well, actually, for k time is only part of these constraints. So. These sets are monotonic this way, which essentially means if at one point you get reverse inclusion, then actually you have reached the maximal positively invariant set. It's very much the same. It's all what changes compared to the initial consideration is that actually you have a different operator, different function of sets. It's, a B, it's one step backward reachable instead of one step control, reach, control, control set. Okay. So when f is continuous, x is compact, x case are compact, and their limit is compact. Their limit would be essentially you take all sets and take intersection. Without com continuity and compactness, this is not true. The example I showed yesterday would illustrate the point. Now, another question that you want to ask yourself, actually, can I guarantee that these sets are non-empty? There is no reason a priori to believe these sets would be empty. But as I said, in control problems we con consider, we typically assume a point x bar such that x bar is in x and x bar is f of x. This would be a point which would be contained in all k step backward reachable sets, so therefore they would be non-empty. It means your computation would not return. Now, so for continuous f and compact x, this should be a single dot. 
the maximal actual positive invariant set is a maximal with respect to inclusion fixed point of this function b. Now, uh, I'm not so sure how much you, you actually have entered into fixed point. You know what the fixed point is of a function. So it's a point at which function doesn't change value. So it's equal to itself. Now, this is just a this is just a function on space of sets instead of space of points. So therefore, you can ask for a fixed point. And typically, under continuity and compactness, you work on the space of compact subsets of Rn, of underlying space. But this is well defined. This is the characterization. Unfortunately, this is only a necessary condition for characterization of the maximal positively invariant set. It's not a sufficient. It becomes sufficient when you consider this maximal trajectory, when you go from host space x. Okay. So in either case, you can have finite determination when you get this condition. All these will be basic blocks for actually testing your code when we start computing this for infinite number of steps. So far, when you looked at these sets, we were computing for finitely many steps. So you would stop after you execute n step cal calculation. But if you want to pass this to the limit, we have to have a condition under which we can stop. And as we said, one of the conditions would be if the iteration converges. Sufficient condition for that is this. So each time when you do a loop, you test this condition. If it's satisfied, you terminate your computation and you report that you have computed the maximal object, maximal control invariant or maximal positive invariant set. OK, so you do need to remember that actually if you have a, if you have the affine system polyhedral constraints, if the target set is polyhedral, the k iterate preserves the polyhedral structure because one step backward reachable set preserves polyhedral structure. It's easy to construct. Effectively, you have this function for one, one step backward reachable set and you just change the target set. The target set becomes xk minus 1 instead of xf. And then you dynamically update the target set in the process. Uh, of course, in the, if, the, if the iteration doesn't terminate in finite time, you have infinitely many constraints, even though they are fine, this is not anymore polyhedral necessary. So you cannot guarantee that limit is affine or polyhedral. But when polyhedral structure is guaranteed, when actually this iteration is finally determined. In the case that you typically consider and that we'll consider, you will look at the linear case, Ax, and you will consider that something which is compact and contains zero in the origin, in the interior. Zero in the interior of the set. Under these assumptions, actually, there is a guarantee that your iteration converges in finite time. And you'll experience that in computation. The reason being is the stability of A tells you that actually, no matter how large this compact set is, eventually, after sufficiently many iterations, you can make this go to the interior of the set. And that essentially is an estimate for the number of steps you need to iterate on. But you'll experience that you're doing the calculations yourself. OK, so at this point in time, I think I just want to brief you on the definitions of stability. Ha what do you know about stability so far? Did you have a, like a course on the stability theory? Most of you, all of you? OK, so then I, I've done the right thing. All what I've done, actually, I have extracted definitions for stability, which will be useful within the context of predictive control and two model predictive control, which comes from tomorrow afternoon, hopefully. So <sighs> typically in stability, I suppose that you are discussing stability of a point. So you can actually generalize that. You can say that O is a closed and positively invariant set for the dynamics. Special case of that is a point. Now, there are two properties you want to analyze in stability that matter. First property is called boundedness of the trajectories. And the second property, you have to be careful with the fingers, the second property <laughs> is the attraction. <laughs> OK, so, so sorry. <laughs> so I'll still watch my language, yes. OK, so now what you really want, the first property of trajectories being bounded means that actually whenever you start in the neighborhood of the set, this d denotes the distance. Okay? Typically, you would have written the norms. And typically, in the stability theory, this would be a 0. So you would just have a point x norm. Now, whenever you start close enough to the set, no matter how small distance I want to keep from the set, number epsilon I give you, you can find a delta, which may depend on the epsilon, such that whenever initial condition is close enough to O, precisely meaning that the distance is smaller than delta, then all trajectories remain within the epsilon neighborhood. This definition is very close to the continuity, if you look at the continuity definition. Now, the second property, this property, does not allow you to tell you that actually trajectories will converge to this set or converge to a point. 
All what it says, they will get to the epsilon neighborhood. They will stay within epsilon neighborhood of the set. And you can make epsilon as small as you like, but it's not never zero. The property of being attractive means that actually, especially when you talk about global attractive, there are no constraints in this particular setting. This means that the distance of trajectories, xk denotes traje trajectories, obviously time k, actually this goes to zero as k goes to infinity. So the first property is being bounded, the second property is being convergent. The importance of being closed and positively invariant is twofold. First, being closed means trajectories will converge inside of the, the, this set. So we will we'll not have this funny behavior. You remember the example I gave you, 0, 1 open interval. You converge to 0, but then at 0 function changes the value, so it jumps outside of the set. So you cannot allow open things. Sequences have to converge inside of the set. And positively invariant, it means actually dynamics remain there forever afterwards. Typically, you're looking at the continuous set. And then what you can say, the set O is globally asymptotically stable for x plus equals f of x, if and only if it satisfies these two properties. So it's locally stable and globally attractive for x plus equals f of x. Okay. In applications, we'll be dealing with O will be typically zero origin. We we'll want to regulate system to origin. Uh, distance will be just a norm or k class function. Now, did you encounter k class functions? k infinity? Great. So I got it good. Now, the second question is actually, when you talk about stability, how do you verify stability? Do you run all possible trajectories and you verify properties for all? <laughs> actually, it's not how you do it. You do it by actually detecting something which is called the Apenhoff function. Now, the Apenhoff function has to be such that actually once you find this function, you can verify the properties of being bounded and convergent. And you'll take the same setting. You have a system. You have a candidate equilibrium set. You'll say that the function, non-negative, is a Apenhoff function for this system with respect to the set O. If there exists k infinity functions, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, such that this function is lower bounded in terms of k infinity alpha 1 function with respect to the distance, upper bounded with function alpha 2, and at the next point in time, for any point in x, you have this decrease measured by alpha 3. Of course, you can actually take the alpha 3 to be positive definite with respect to 0. I mean, I've just put everything in terms of the k infinity functions for simplicity. And this is a typical setting that you'll encounter in MPC. So typically in MPC, this function v of x will be value function. But when we come to MPC, we'll talk about it. So this would be very simple setting. So we have a stability of a dynamical system with respect to equilibrium set and Lyapunov function. What's the next thing? Next thing would be essentially under constraints. OK, so will anything change when you have a constraint? So when you restrict the considerations locally. What's going to change now? Actually, the previous definition was a global definition. It worked for the whole space. When you have a constraint, actually, it's overly optimistic to expect that actually you'll be able to stabilize the system globally. Simply because if you have a state constraint which restrict the state space, you cannot cover the whole space or underlying space. So what you, you, what you'll need now, you'll have an equilibrium set, and you'll have another set which is domain of attraction. Now, domain of attraction will be the space in which you can stabilize the system. The assumptions you will need, of course, for the reasons I explained previously, O has to be closed and positively invariant, while actually X has to be positively invariant for the dynamics. And typically, you want O to be a subset of interior of X. So if you have a just point, essentially what you're really talking about, this would be your X and this would be your O. Okay. So outside of the x, you cannot guarantee stabilizing properties. And because of that, what you really need, you need to modify definition. Now, essentially, it's going to be locally stable in x, very much the same. The only difference now is that you're taking po points in the neighborhood of equilibria, which belong to x. Okay. Now, if your row was, for, exa for example, here, then actually, when you would take points from which you can start, they have to actually belong to the x. So you would take intersection, because only x is positively invariant. Uh, and of course, the same condition is the boundedness. Attractivity, again, it means that actually the distance, so the trajectory is converged to all as k goes to infinity. And then you can say it's asymptotically stable. All what changes, it's not anymore globally. It's in x. It's inside of this domain of attraction. 
and definition is more or less the same. <laughs> okay. Once you have stability under constraints, what you really need next is Lyapunov function. And uh, if you look at the previous slide for the Lyapunov function, here you had x in Rn. You had these inequalities. You didn't have domain of attraction here. What you really need to know, you have attraction, a domain of attraction, and you have, oops, sorry, it's not that one. You have these additional conditions, and you change only one line in, the, in your definition. So instead of for all x in Rn, this can be, of course, function can be extended to Rn. So if you memorize this definition, and if you put x equals Rn, then you're most likely fine as long as this is a subset of interior of Rn. Of course, as long as it's a bounded, closed, and positively invariant set, you're fine. So <laughs> the major difficulty with uh, stability, where does major difficulty with stability lies, in your opinion? What is the most difficult for verifying stability in general case? Constructing Lyapunov. Exactly, precisely. Well, actually, writing conditions that this function can sat should satisfy is relatively easy. Finding such functions is far from easy, because if you were able to find these functions in an easy manner, then actually a lot of control theory would be thrown through the window. Luckily enough, that's not the case. So there is a plenty of research questions for you and your PhD. <laughs> OK, so now the next thing is actually what happens when you have a control system. And the simplest way to do it is to say, OK, so now we have a u, which means essentially we can choose a control, or we can choose a control function u of x. Now, we know if we had a u equals k of x, we know how to say when the system is stable. Yeah. So therefore, all what we need to do is to say, O is controlled globally asymptotically stable if and only if there exists a control feedback, kappa, which renders this set globally asymptotically stable for the closed loop dynamics. So the controlled stability definition requires you to find a control feedback which would stabilize the system. In the absence of the control variable, you have a closed loop dynamics. There is nothing for you to find. You just analyze dynamics. In the control case, you're looking simultaneously for the control feedback. <laughs> and uh, OK, now, here is one of the things which maybe is slightly out, out of the blue here. But when looking for control functions, uh, often when somebody asks you about function, you assume single valued function immediately. Yep. It's non-intuitive to think about functions which have multiple values. Even though yesterday we saw these sets of admissible controls, which are functions which assign to a point x whole set of controls. But we can't implement the whole set of controls to a system. What does it mean to say to a ship, go anywhere you like? Go from the left to the right any direction you want? Mm. If I was the captain of the ship, I would be very un displeased with such a control. Because in the end, if something goes wrong, I would be the guilty because I was taking decisions. I would rather claim error on the control algorithm than my choice. So in either case, um, typically this kappa of x needs not be single valued function. And in fact, in many control problems of interest, requiring continuity of the control function, even when the system is controlled, prevents you to stabilize the system. The best known example is holonomic systems. So when you want to park your car, can you actually do it in a continuous manner? So you typically have a maneuver which requires you to come back. So there is this continuity in the feedback. That's one of the examples. There are many such examples that actually you do require discontinuous feedbacks. Now, when the feedback is discontinuous, you may like to close the graph of the feedback. And this is now maths. I'm not going to bother you. But essentially, there is an operation which allows you to regularize the system. That means taking all points at the points of discontinuity, so to speak, limit points. But again, all what I'm saying, at the time, this feedback for purpose of analysis might have to be multivalued. And in model predictive control, there is no reason to expect that the minimizer is a single valued point. Let me give you a simple example. Okay. Let's say you have a system x plus equals x plus u. And let's say our set O is minus 1, 1. OK, and let's say our u is anything between minus 1 and 1. OK, and let's say our objective is to get as close as possible to our set O. OK, 
Now, if you look at the x and if you look at the optimal u of x, whenever you are positive between 0 and 1, you actually can put the control to 1. Also, up to 2, you can actually take it back. Outside of 2, your best choice is to take a control minus 1. Yeah? By symmetry, But what's happening at zero? When we're at zero, I can choose a control. Apparently, I can choose a control one to go to one, or I can choose a control minus one to go to minus one. So at zero, the control becomes multivalued. OK? And this is exactly what it says. It says that at this specific point, I have a choice. I have to decide to go left or right. And this causes discontinuity. And this is something you may get in optimization. This problem may be one of actually having satellite to visit number of points, and at a particular point it has to decide where to go, and going left and right gives you the same cost. So the feedback might have to be multivalued. In either case, all what I'm trying to say is such cases might happen, but the definition will still remain valid. You would have to require that for all points dynamics generate. Okay, so condition for the now what you change, because you have this in V of x u, and you're looking for a minimal value of the cost at the next point in time. Now, if you have closed the loop with the dynamics, you would actually just put f of x kappa of x inside of the third inequality. And if you look at the multivalued, you would have to take the worst case point. Now, this should be z in f of. So you generate all these points through dynamics due to the discontinuity, and you look at the decrease with respect to that. You won't, luckily enough, you won't encounter any of this. And you have this, I just gave you ideas to the slides. A very good overview of all these definitions can be found in the book by Mann and Rawlings that I have provided for the lit. I'm just making you aware of some of the things that may happen which are not pointed out in the, in the literature. Now, <coughs> how do you change the local conditions? Well, all what you have to really do, you have to assume now that actually feedback that you find satisfies constraints and actually ensures that you asymptotically stabilize in x-closed loop dynamics. So control, st control stability, even though definition requires the rewarding, is best understood by the one as actually in which, once you find the feedback, you have recovered the previous case of ordinary stability. So the properties you ensure for the closed loop dynamics by applying the feedback f kappa, sorry, kappa, to the system f of x u become the ones that actually you had in autonomous case. OK. And then, of course, if you want to look at the equation, what you need to have, you need to have this, and you need to have these constraints. You have to remain inside of the x. Now, typically, when we do MPC, the first two properties, being bounded, is going to be granted by construction. Third property is the property that will be often after. This third property is called the Lyapunov decrease property. And this is the most difficult property to establish. Now, just to give you an idea to simplify this kind of uh, broad definitions. If you have a linear systems, just autonomous systems, how would you actually find? Okay, so for the linear systems, x k plus one equals a x k. How can you verify stability of this system? So stability of this system depends on the properties of the matrix A. More specifically, depends on the properties of the eigen eigen values of A. Because this is a discrete time, if we want a strict stability, that means that eigenvalues, absolute value of eigenvalues of A has to be less than 1 of the maximal eigenvalue. Yeah? So they have to be inside of the unit circle. Equivalently, you can solve so-called Lyapunov equation. What would be the associated Lyapunov equation? So you would be looking for a fu your function v of x, which is candidate Lyapunov function, would be x transpose px where P is a positive symmetric, positive definite symmetric matrix. Now, the Lyapunov condition would require you to have A transpose P A minus P is strictly less than 0. Yep. How did we get this? Well, actually, if you work out V of AX, just plug in there, you'll get x transpose, a transpose, p, a, x. 
if you form v of ax. So typically you need to have v of x, v of ax less, strictly less than v of x. It's slightly outside of that definition, but I'll, I'll show you how you can convert it to that condition. This is enough for stability. So if you convert this, you have x transpose a transpose p a x minus x transpose p x less than zero. You pull out x transposes, so you get a transpose p a minus p x less than zero. And as this holds for all x's, you obtain this equation, this inequality. Now, you can actually make this Lyapunov equation by setting this equals minus q, where then actually decrease would be given by the quadratic function x transpose x. So then you would have this equation, minus L of x, which would fit with that framework. And this equation is solvable. It's a Lyapunov equation. You have it actually d Lyap function in MATLAB. You have to just be careful when you call this d Lyap function because I think it, um, it has a transposed version of this equation. So when you pass in the matrices, you have to make sure that you pass right transposed version of the matrices. Okay. So this is one of the, unfortunately, this is a rather trivial case because it's just a linear dynamics. Anything more than a linear case, there is no systematic way of finding. Of course, once you know how to do a linear case, what you can argue, you can argue that actually if I linearize my system around an equilibrium point of interest, and if linear part is dominant, sufficiently dominant, then actually I can deduce something about stability using the linearizations. And this is often quite okay. There could be some problems. Specifically, there could be a problems when you try to discre discretize, uh, uh, well, when you try to linearize nonlinear functions, you may actually get non-controllable linearizations at equilibrium point, which essentially would lead you to funny conclusions. So you have to be very careful. So as a matter of fact, I'm going now to praise MPC, even though I didn't say what MPC is. MPC will provide the means for generating a nice uh, systematic, a systematic and nice uh, framework for generating the of functions for constraints and even more under uncertainty as well. Okay, so with this, uh, I'm catching up with everything I, I wanted to cover yesterday. So I'm delayed by two lectures right now, which means we'll have to speed up as of next lecture. And, uh, but now I'm still going to be nice, so I'm going to give you five minutes of questions. Right. So these definitions are for your benefits. Okay. There is a nice overview in the books I provided. I didn't pinpoint everything in, in lectures, but I have extracted everything that should help you a lot. I want to leave something to your well, curiosity, let's say intellectual curiosity and the search for relevant parts in the books. Uh, okay, so now this is a kind of, this gives you an overview of things that actually you should, the terminology, notions, concepts that you should start being familiar with. Uh, unfortunately now we have to, not unfortunately, but we have to repeat this exercise for the case when we have uncertainty. So when the W parameter enters your equation, how to handle all these questions. So we have to repeat the kind of questions of controllability and the questions of reachability. And once that's done, let's say two more lectures, we are focusing on what I find to be fun part of the course. And that's a tube MPC. That's something I worked on a lot and I can do it without slides. Okay. I, I'll do it with slides, but <laughs> <laughs> you can wake me up at 11 o'clock and I can tell you a story about that. About this, I need to look it up. I don't keep it in mind. So the, the expressions are nasty most of the times, but if you look through definitions and if you build a system how to memorize them, specifically, as I said, you start from the global definition in terms of the stability, and you see the conditions you have. The next question is the Lyapunov function, and you see, sorry, that was the Lyapunov function. You look at the definitions, so there are two properties, boundness, attraction, and then you put these two together to get global asymptotic stability. Then, what, how do you verify this? You verify this by verifying the existence of the function. Function has to be suitably lower and upper bounded with respect to the equilibrium set, which could be just a point, and you have this decrease condition. Typically, decrease condition is the most difficult one. By construction of the function, you will have a lower and upper bound. Typically, this Lyapunov function is related to the energy, which means it's a kind of quadratic function. If it's a quadratic function, then you might have bounds in terms of the smallest and largest eigenvalues of the Hessian associated with this quadratic function. 
Okay. So those two are typically not difficult. The most difficult one is verifying the third condition, which is the condition which actually ensures the, the attraction. Once you have that, you restrict yourself to local consideration, which requires you to start talking about properties with respect to that set in which everything remains. Everything is the same, the same with the, and then if you add the constraints, if you add controlled, all what you say actually, if I close the loop with some feedback, I have to recover definitions in the previous case. So really, you can build the system to memorize all these definitions or to understand them from the basic ones. But I'll leave that to you. There is a five minutes before the break, and during these five minutes, I think I can answer two questions, maybe, or maybe none. Any questions so far? Now, uh, the speed of the course, the material, the, the, the lectures, the exercises, are you getting used to it? I understand that yesterday I might have had overly optimistic expectations <laughs> about me and about your coding, because I thought I would cover three lectures yesterday. I didn't. So I thought that some of the things, but you will see the way I structured your coding exercises they're kind of modules that actually you can reuse and build together. And you'll see that as we go along. There are a few, I'm not saying that's the best way to program it, but I thought it was most, well, most accessible way for you to reuse the material and to understand the material. Again, uh, it's a pseudo code, it's useful just for testing the things, but you, once you, when you have this code, you can actually build a sophisticated code out of it, because this is really a core. You can add all sorts of testing you need inside and writing the fancy messages in MATLAB or etc. Okay, so if that's all, one more question last time. Save the last dance for me. No questions? Okay, so then we'll have a bit, a 15 minutes break and we'll, uh, we'll have a bit longer second lecture. Thank you. Bye.